Welcome to Under the Microscope. This series is brought to you by the Real Scientists Nano team. Our goal is to provide a platform where scientists can communicate their work and interact with the public. With that in mind, every week we introduce you to a scientist working in the field of materials and nanoscience, who would be curating the Real Sci Under Scroll Nano Twitter account. Hello everyone, today we have with us Sean Allen, who is a postdoctoral uh, scholar at UCLA. Hi Sean, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you doing? I am great and excited to learn more about your research. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start uh, by understanding your scientific journey so far. So how did you end up in your current research field? Yeah, it's actually uh, been a pretty windy road. Um, I actually first wanted to start doing science in middle school. Um, I had just read this book that my dad gave me called Engines of Creation, which is about nanoparticles and nanotechnology. Mm -hmm. um, and I had also just heard that cancer cells were immortal. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, hey, what if we could use cancer cells to become immortal was like my middle school idea. Um, oh. And, you know, that plus sort of in my mind, nanoparticles were like little machines or robots or something. So I kind of imagined like, oh, maybe we can use little robots to like keep us alive forever. Mm -hmm. And that was so interesting to me that I decided I'd, I want to try to do research into this someday. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, so I went to undergrad and uh, got my bachelor's degree in biology with an emphasis on immunology. Mm -hmm. And then I went and got a master's, but uh, the lab I was in was developmental biology. So, you know, I was going in a different direction, trying that out. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, in my PhD program, we got to do rotations, which I thought was uh, a really great opportunity to try out new stuff. So... Mm -hmm. I rotated in a chemistry lab and a um, sort of like a dry programming lab, computational lab. Mm -hmm. And then the last one I rotated in was a nanomaterials uh, biomedical engineering lab, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the day, that's the one that clicked the most. And so I kind of ended up doing a lot of biomaterials work. And in that case, um, all the biomaterials work was related to the immune system. Mm -hmm. Got my PhD and then uh, I've joined this lab now at UCLA where uh, my work is kind of similar, nanomaterials, immune system, but then the final layer is cancer. Mm -hmm. so, and then you wrap that all together, yeah. Okay, that, that's quite an interesting journey. So would you say now that you're doing what you thought you would do in middle school? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, uh, weirdly, it kind of turned back around to that original thought. Uh, you know, nanoparticles are not quite the robots that I thought they were, but, mm -hmm. uh, and cancer cells being immortal is not like the easy solution to mortality that I thought it was, but, right. you know, still, uh, yeah, very similar, very similar. Ah, that's, that's, well, you, when you thought about that idea, you were in middle school and you didn't really know. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I would say, yes, you are doing what you thought you would do <laughs> while you were in middle school. Um, that's amazing. So if you are not doing that, what you thought exactly in middle school, uh, where do you, where would you say your current research falls in this big picture of materials or nanoscience? Yeah, so I think it's very applications based. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the the material that we're using right now, uh, mesoporous silica nanoparticles, uh, it's one that has a very long history, um, you know, dating back first to industry having developed it. And then uh, now, you know, it's starting to enter into some of the more biomedical sciences. And uh, I, I think it's about kind of leveraging the nanomaterials, nanoscience side of things to mm -hmm. better facilitate stuff like drug delivery um, right. with the more biological side. So I think, you know, I, I come at it from a biologist perspective, 
mm-hmm. that was kind of like my all of my schooling is in biology mm-hmm. um and and the nanoscience side is kind of like a tool to to leverage for that biology mm-hmm. okay so it's quite multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary and we are leveraging the best of all the worlds <laughs> <laughs> yeah well uh, i'm i'm lucky because uh in both my PhD and here in my postdoc, um, I get to work pretty directly with the nanomaterial side because you're right, it is so multidisciplinary just in general. It could be very easy for me to just either buy a nanomaterial or have another scientist develop the nanomaterial and then I, I use it for my own only biology work. Uh, right. But in both cases, I, I was able to make nanomaterials myself sort of investigate their properties, tweak them, and choose one that works well for, for what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Uh, that's really cool, though. Uh, and it does sound to me that you do a lot of interesting um, experiments, and you were and are involved in a lot of interesting research projects. Um, so if you have to pick one uh, that you're most proud of, I know it's difficult to pick one. I know it's difficult. <laughs> Uh, the, the most fun or quirky one. Could you pick one and explain it to us in simple words in the section we call In Other Words? <laughs> yeah, so um, it is difficult to mm-hmm. pick one um, <laughs> because uh, especially in my PhD, I did a lot of weird and quirky side projects. Oh, so yeah. actually the, the one that paid off the most and I think it was very meaningful to me, uh, was a side project I did on the fabrication of the nanoparticles that I was making. So at the time, the nanoparticles that I made were made out of these little polymers. And the polymers um, are amphiphilic. So one part likes water, one part uh, hates water. Mm -hmm. And so when you put them into water, they'll automatically form little nanostructures, Mm -hmm. right? Like little micelles or little vesicles. And uh, the thing is that there was a few ways we were making the nanoparticles, but they all kind of took a while. Um, They would involve coating glass with a thin film, Mm -hmm. or they would involve uh, solvent kind of dripping into stirring water and stuff like that. Um, And I kind of thought it would be nice if we had a faster way and a way that could scale up better Um, because eventually I'd like it if some of these things were in people, but people are much bigger than mice, so we would need a lot more of it. Right. Um, So in this project, I basically um, took a design uh, that had been developed a few years before for something called a uh, flash nanoprecipitation device. Mm-hmm. Um, it's basically like a microfluidics device where you shoot two jets of solvent together mm-hmm. and they mix in a little chamber. And I guess the virtue of this device is that they mix really thoroughly and very quickly. Mm-hmm. So uh-huh. you, you control the geometry really well so that the mixing happens very uniformly. Okay. Um, but you can flow through a lot of volume of liquid through this little mixing chamber. So uh, using that device and our polymer, um, I managed to make the different nanoparticles that we were making uh, just using this little this little mixer. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's weird that, like I, I've done work with treating atherosclerosis and now doing work treating cancer and everything but the that experiment um sort of sticks in my mind the most like now the lab uh that i did my phd in that's their main way of making the nanoparticles and they're able to make larger batches with more polymer and you know it it makes a few novel nanoparticle shapes that we couldn't make before Mm -hmm. so it's, it's kind of like it's a weird uh tangent from my normal work but it it felt like really satisfying to get to do something on kind of the sort of more engineering side and Mm -hmm. and actually you know the the process of making the nanoparticles 
Right. Yeah, I can imagine why you picked this as part of your so uh, as the answer to the project that the most quirky fun or the most <laughs> fun one. I do have a question regarding the amount that you could make because the microfluidic channels are quite tiny. They're micro size. Mm-hmm. So would you just shoot uh, fluids from two sides at all times and then drain it, shoot again, drain it? Or how did you manage to scale up? Right. So so it is um, continuously draining out into a reservoir. Oh, uh, that makes sense. <laughs> and so, you, so you, can, you can continuously be shooting through a stream. And it's true that the volume that you're pushing through uh, in any one second is relatively small. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe may on the order of like uh, a milliliter per second or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can basically continuously push that through so that in a minute you've gone through 60 mils, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which uh, already is like way more than we what? really need for uh, our purposes in lab. Right. Um, but also some really cool work with scaling up that geometry uh, has been published. And so I, I think that there there's really cool ways of making what was once a microfluidics device more of a kind of macrofluidics device, sort of. Um, right. But yeah, uh, I, I think it's 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 by virtue of being continuous flow. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. That makes sense. It it's so it's so innovative. I would have never imagined that a microfluidic channel is being used to make synthesize nanomaterials or nanoparticles yeah there's um yeah there, there's actually a commercial device uh that uses the little actual microfluidic chips to make liposomes um huh. and those are really fascinating because i mean liposomes are maybe out, out of nanoparticles they're the the nanoparticle with the most acceptance in sort of clinical use mm-hmm. And uh, and these devices are very cool, um, very cool devices. You you get the little microfluidics chip. You can reuse them a few times, mm-hmm. and you basically just flow through your lipids and your aqueous buffer, and you just you form out little uniform liposomes. Very very neat technology. That's so cool. Scientists are amazing. It's just like this is so cool. It's so cool. Uh, <laughs> All right, I'm going to tone down my fascination a little bit. (laughs) I'm going to try and stick with asking you questions. Uh, So now let's move away from the lab and towards the other sides of of a researcher's life, which is oftentimes teaching. So do you teach? And if you don't teach, would you like to teach? And if you would like to teach, what would you like to teach? (laughs) questions. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so currently, I'm not teaching. Uh, mm-hmm. This this position that I'm in is just uh, solely based on research. Mm-hmm. I TA'd some classes back in the day in my PhD and master's degree, um, mm-hmm. and I really like teaching. I think uh, it's actually a really good way to kind of ground your own understanding in something, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I think everything that I understand best it's because I've tried teaching it to somebody. Mm-hmm. So I really I really enjoy it and I hope that at some point I get a return to teaching. Um, I, I think being able to teach a class on either biomaterials or teaching a class on the uh, nanomaterials biological interface would be very interesting for me um, because uh, I, I understand biology pretty well, um, but a realm that is continuously important to my research is how nanomaterials interact with it. So I, I think that'd be a really great uh, great thing to be able to teach in the future. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think it's also needed, right? These kinds of uh, lectures are needed to be at the interface of life sciences and natural sciences to speak broadly. Um, I think that would be really, really uh, interesting and important. Let me know when you st- you start teaching. I will attend that. that, that. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I'll ask you all so many questions. I'm already asking you so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> all right, moving on to uh, to go, going back to the research experience. So, Sean, I, I hope your research experience has been wonderful so far. It sounds like it has been wonderful so far. And I hope that it will be wonderful in the future as well. 
Um, however, uh, if you had three wishes to improve your research experience, what would you ask for? And I'm not promising anything here yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, this is uh, not an easy question for me to answer. Um, but one thing on the very sciencey side is cancer is such a complicated thing. It, it's such a complicated thing to study. Right. And one of the things that I think has become very clear over the past 20 to 30 years is that a lot of our models for cancer kind of diverge in a lot of significant ways from human cancer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, people have done a lot of work to figure out what what can you use mouse models for and what how that can that inform you about what would happen in humans. Uh, I hope that that progress continues that like I, I would love more tools in terms of mouse models um, that can better recapitulate human cancer and and the immune system because uh, one of the big things is you can use um, nude mice to grow like human tumors and stuff like that but to prevent immune rejection those mice they don't have a competent immune system they're missing like t-cells so you know since my work is about the immune system also uh, I can't use those kinds of mice I, I need to rely on other kinds of models so Right. I, I hope that that work keeps going because uh, it's already incredible what other scientists have managed to create in terms of models. But mm -hmm. uh, it could always be better, and I, I could always use be better. Well. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's that's one of them. And then I think uh, the other big one right now that's on my mind during these pandemic times is uh, is I miss the undergrad help around lab. You know, like I, the, having undergrads around definitely improves my research experience. Um, I mean, not just as like physically helping with experiments, that's nice. Mm -hmm. But um, the it's, it's another kind of opportunity to both teach and interact with like a very different and fresh perspective on things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, undergrads, a lot of times, by virtue of not being kind of bogged down by all the same experience and information have like really insightful new ideas right so i miss having them around i miss having them in lab um i don't know when they're going to get to be back you know the yeah. different, cam different campuses are closed for different amounts of time and i think uh our campus is trying to be very careful i want i want everyone to be safe but yeah i if if anything, I, I wish that I could have them back around safely. As soon as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as soon as safely possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so two wishes. Do you have a third one? I guess if I were going to come up with a third one, um, one thing that's always been difficult in nanoparticle characterization is there's a lot of different ways to characterize nanoparticles, but no one way to do it super well. Right, like every every way of figuring out uh, the diameter of a nanoparticle has some kind of flaw. DLS has some kind of flaw. Um, you know, SACS has a flaw. Cryo TEM and TEM have like sampling flaws. So mm -hmm. I, I and and some of them are very difficult to do. Right, uh, Cryo TEM is notoriously difficult to do even though the images are so beautiful when it's done well. Um, and so I, I, I wish that, or I, yeah, I, I basically hope that there's more development of tools that can kind of draw, uh, have more strengths in areas where something like maybe DLS does not have a strength, uh, but is kind of easier to use than TEM. Uh, so I, I, I wish for something like that, that would make my life a lot faster and easier. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all the all the scientific equipment making companies <laughs> out there. Yes, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> the scientists want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, I, I completely understand. And uh, actually, your first wish is quite interesting. I myself don't know much about your field, but it does 
you did convince me that now this is extremely important for us to have uh, a solution and always be better always have a better model um, and the second of course uh, i wish i could just do it with a snap of my fingers and be like <laughs> all undergrads safely back in office not just undergrads everyone back uh, we are ending the para pandemic now it's over we are bored of it let's get <laughs> Not pun intended, of course. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I, I wish, um, I hope that we are working uh, towards solving these issues, and I w hope that we are in the near future. Uh, wishes of yours will come true. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and speaking of future, uh, what are you most looking forward to in the next three months, other than your undergrads hopefully being back? <laughs> Yeah, geez. Uh, if it happened in the next three months, that would be much sooner than I expect. But um, yeah, uh, next three months. I have pretty much finished a paper that um, I'm going to be submitting, I think, in the next month or so. So mm -hmm. I, I hope that that arrives at the editor's desk safely and that they like it enough to send it out for review. Uh, I don't know if I'll get reviews back in the next three months, um, but you know, hopefully hopefully sometime not too long after that. So that's, that's one big thing I'm looking forward to is kind of putting that chunk of the project to rest so that I can begin uh, building on it for the next, the next leg of the project, which I'm, I'm looking forward to a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I'll keep my fingers crossed that it is. You finish the manuscript, you submit it, and you also get reviews and acceptance soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That would be really quick, though, right? The turnaround time of two months after submitting in one month. Yeah. What? Yeah. Uh, that is, I think, probably half the time that it normally takes Average. for like the speediest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Before we let you go, Sean, what we want to understand from you is uh, what are the big challenges faced by the field uh, of materials for nanoscience or like nanoscience in general? What are the big questions that scientists are looking uh, like working towards answering? Yeah. So, you know, particularly in the field that I'm in, which is using nanomaterials to try to help diagnose and treat cancer. I think uh, one of the major directions that people are still working toward is being able to consistently uh, see results. The, the, there's, there's a, cancer is so complicated and there's so many different forms um, and it has so many uh, evasion tactics that there's been limited clinical success when it comes to applying nanomaterials to fighting cancer. So what one of the first and kind of biggest names in uh, FDA approved nanomedicines is Doxil, which is a doxorubicin liposome formulation. Mm -hmm. And when Doxil came on the market, people were like, wow, you know, this might be a new uh, sort of start of a whole generation of nano drugs for mm -hmm. for cancer and for everything else and there's just been pretty limited successes um in some cases nanomaterials might make treatments a little bit safer but not any more efficacious mm -hmm. um and in other cases they just don't work all that well and so there there's still this disconnect where there's a lot of really amazing a lot of really amazing work making novel nanomaterials really beautiful and strange. You know, you see the cryo TM pictures, they're so cool looking. They have like spiral shapes mm -hmm. or like nano stars. And, you know, uh, pe people make so many beautiful novel materials. But uh, one thing I hope as, as this whole field matures is that we'll see additional work in the push to clinical use mm -hmm. um, in sort of the, the, the maturation of these really interesting nanomaterials to actual applications. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's still something that we're searching for. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, the, the sooner it gets there, the better, because I, I really do think that there are um, 
particular benefits of nanomaterials for things like drug delivery, um, and they just haven't fully materialized yet in clinical use. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically the valley between the lab bench and market shelf, the big valley that is the clinical trials or getting to the market shelf, um, that is something that needs work on and okay, all right, that's that's actually interesting. Well, I hope that uh, the valley gets shallower and shallower, that more and more <laughs> nanomaterials or nano, um, like drug carrying nanomaterials do jump from the lab to the market shelf to actually help with the cancer treatments. Um, uh, it has been wonderful speaking with you, Sean. I myself have, have learned a lot and your field of work is really, really interesting. So thank you very much for taking the time for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. We are looking forward to having you on Real Scientist Nano. <laughs>